welcome to American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. Today's title, today's topic for the show is Status of, of the Election Campaigns. Uh, we have less, well, about seven months before November and seven short months before we determine who our next president is for the 2025 um, administration. We have candidates, we have basically three candidates now on the field, Donald Trump, President Joe Biden, and believe it or not, Robert Kennedy Jr. He's actually uh, as a candidate that actually is pulling some numbers. So we're gonna talk about the pros and cons of each campaign, what policies are helping the candidates, what positions they're taking is not helping the candidates, and then of course, how RFK Jr. is um, basically interfering or not interfering with either candidate. So with, with me to discuss these topics is my faithful co-host, Jay Fidel, and our special esteemed guest who's returned. Thank you, Cynthia, Lee, and Claire. Morning. Good morning. morning. Hey, Jay, um, seven months left to go. And if you look at most polling, and, and again, I acknowledge that the, it's way too early to, to get a sense of how each campaign's doing by looking at polls. Even if we get closer to November, um, I remember your philosophy that polling is um, a highly inaccurate art form, certainly not um, a, a, a true means of predictions. But uh, how would you classify where we are in this point in time between the Trump campaign and the President Biden campaign? Um, I would say that it's in play, fully in play. Uh, nobody knows what is going to happen. Nobody knows how these various issues, which we should talk about, will affect the electorate, how the electorate will swing. Um, we're in a, um, a kind of, um, um, we're, we're in a trough, okay, and the wave will get bigger. Uh, the things will happen. You know, I always, I always say this, Tim, things will happen, things that we cannot actually predict will happen in this shortened period between now and the election. But for now, I think it's all churning at the bottom of the trough, and uh, it will reveal itself for the next couple of months. So uh, you should say to the, the viewers, uh, stay tuned. That's what you should say. Let's stay tuned. Okay, let's, let's talk about each candidate um, rather than try to mix between the two because I'll get the audience confused. Let's talk about Trump. Let's talk about those positions he's taking right now, seven months in advance of the election, that are actually helping him uh, with his, his polling numbers. Uh, I'll just say as a side note, I, I think the MAGA voters, no matter what he says or does, will remain in his column. And the question is, to what percent in each state uh, are the MAGA voters um, going to turn out and vote for him? In the past, we've looked anywhere between 28 to 33 percent. I don't know if those numbers still hold at this point in time, but uh, safe to assume it's somewhere in that range. So obviously, that's way short of a uh, 51 percent. So uh, what? Let's just take a look at a couple of um, things that Donald Trump seems to be winning well on, and that is um, his position on the economy. For whatever reason, despite the high the high positive numbers of um, the reduction of inflation, the the unemployment numbers that are falling, the G, you know, our gross product getting better, uh, retail sales getting better, consumer confidence getting better. It, it seems that we've pulled out of the COVID doldrums of the economy, and it's far, far better. Probably the stock market, the Dow Jones, the NASDAQ, they're at their highest levels ever. These are normally traditional indicators of a successful economy. Yet Joe Biden's taking it on the, on the chin that people are saying the economy is still not good. Donald Trump seems to be the benefactor of that. Your thoughts? Well, <clears throat> I think this is a question of whether uh, he can successfully lie. Mm, this, is, this is his campaign is lying about the economy. They're blaming uh, Biden for failures on the economy when, in fact, Biden has been successful on the economy. And the, uh, the Trump bubble of media, 
um, you know, goes on and on about how it's all Biden's fault and the economy is in, in rough waters. That's just simply not true. What we have is the classical big lie here. And <clears throat> Fox News and others actively, if you thought that Fox News had straightened out, Tim, Cynthia, it hasn't. It's doing the same thing, the same thing with Sinclair Radio, no pun intended. Uh, and so, you know, what, what we have is the big lie and people still believe it. But the question I put is, isn't that shrinking? Aren't some people in the base who would you know, see that kind of media, are they maybe getting the message now? Even a few of them, even a small percentage of them getting the message that in fact the economy is better. You know, when, when the, um, the, the right wing tells you that, you know, you're not doing well, that uh, jobs are falling, um, that the inflation is eating you up, um, that the country is in deep economic trouble, and you look around and you see that's, that's really not so. Um, maybe you get the idea that it's a big lie. But anyway, on that one, you know, maybe he still has traction with the people who, you know, absorb that propaganda. Um, he shouldn't. And maybe it'll change. I, I hope that between now and November, or at least whenever people ultimately vote, because it could be before November, um, they will they will see enough. Now, one of the things in this in this little calculus is how the other media is doing. Are they adequately um, reporting to say no? The economy is great. Now I hear them say that, but are they saying it enough? Are they saying it strongly enough um, to reach the base or at the fringes of the base? And it's not clear. I think the media, all the media, ought to be harping on that to deal with big lies. When we find a big lie, we have to make a big truth. Are they doing that? Good point. Let's look at another uh, campaign strategy of Trump's and whether it's a campaign strategy or just part of his personality that he can't let something go. Um, you know, we've heard Donald Trump saying, if I'm not elected, you may see the last, 2024 may be the last election ever held. Uh, if I'm not elected, there'll be a bloodbath. These are direct quotes. Um, we have the big 2020 election loss lie that is still part of this year's campaign. Um, I, was, I was cheated out of an election. I was cheated out of a second term back in 2020. Uh, we know that that strategy didn't work for 2022. Um, a lot of Trump candidates didn't make it because they were um, election deniers as well didn't work well. Uh, the red wave that was predicted didn't happen because of that very uh, topic. Yet Donald Trump in 2024 is hanging on to it. Does that strategy work uh, to get the independents and or normal, regular, old-fashioned GOP behind them? Short answer, no, it doesn't work. I'll tell you why I think it doesn't work. Um, it's, it's that, who's his audience on this? Is he talking to suburban housewives? Um, that, that is only going to scare them. Uh, that is only going to make them believe that mm, Trumpers are out there in the streets and are going to beat them up somehow. Um, I don't think it works on most people, you know, in the, in the, the left bubble, the liberal bubble, because they see it for what it is. On the other hand, the people in the Trump bubble, um, they see it, to use your term, Tim, as stochastic. Um, he, what he's really trying to do is tell people that they should go out on the streets. They should prepare for another insurrection. They, they should prepare for violence. And that may not work the same way now, because the Department of Justice, however limp it's been on this, um, you know, did prosecute. A lot, a lot of people were sorry they went into the Capitol on January 6th, and they're not going to go into the Capitol again. And they're not going to get involved in, in, in fisticuffs again. So I think the number of people who are likely to be stoked by his stochastic remarks may be shrinking. In any event, he's only talking to them. He's not talking to the rest of us. The rest of us say, wait a minute, this is the guy who did January 6th. Why would we vote for somebody who was promising another January 6th? Um, so I don't think this works. I think this paints him as someone who is calling for chaos and violence 
And I don't think anybody except the most dedicated uh, base members uh, are going to like that. So I think he's actually losing ground on that issue. Okay. Thank you, Jay. Cynthia, um, I'm going to kind of pivot over to Trump's seemingly success with the social wedge issues. And I'll name a few of them here. Uh, it seems to get, again, um, his mega base, anywhere from 28 to 33 percent, is solidly in his column. But uh, there's some social wedge issues that seem to get some crossover from independents and even Democrats. Uh, what are those uh, look like? Well, I think um, Donald Trump has mentioned in his campaign speeches that he wants to see a death penalty for drug dealers. That seems to win some, some uh, hearts and minds. Uh, he wants to do what's called the Trump Reciprocal Trade Act, and that is whatever China does or any other country does to the United States, we're going to do it back to you and worse. Um, kind of the revenge tour concept, which brings me to the revenge tour, that um, he's going to go after certain entities, uh, Garland, A.G. Garland, uh, go after, the you know, cut civil service jobs, teach them a lesson, uh, go after the owners of CNN, MSNBC, NBC, uh, basically starting a personal enemies list. Um, General Mark Milley comes to mind on that one. We also have that um, he wants to basically um, call out executive orders to cut school funding, cut the you know school lunch programs. He also wants to do a severe cutback on anything that's caught, taught in the education of school children. Uh, no, no sorts of, of sense of history uh, that he wants to, you know, have present in our current curriculums at schools. Wants to cut out anything that has to do with woke ideology or woke concepts. Uh, can you can you expand this list, Cynthia, as far as other social issues that he seems to be winning the day on? That's not just to the MAGA voters, but uh, catches the interest of independents. Immigration is number one, right? <laughs> um, and then we've got the Republicans in Congress that won't let an immigration bill even come to the floor or vote on it or anything. And so they're just backing him up. He wants to use that. And I think that's a really key number one social issue. It's that white, you know, anxiety that they, that white replacement theory that so many of his voters are in that. Yeah. Category. Let me ask you on that point. Cause that's a great, your great, great point you're bringing up. <clears throat> so if you're an independent, and you agree that there is an immigration mess at you know, the southern border, and Donald Trump takes the field on that issue, yet it's Donald Trump that prevents what was going to be a workable uh, proposed bill that, that would benefit immigration greatly, and certainly the Republican Party greatly. Yet Donald Trump is a roadblock to that because he wants to use it as a campaign wedge issue. If you're an independent, how do you determine whether the immigration issue is in Donald Trump's column or Joe Biden's? Well, I think that people are disaffected from either at this moment because, you know, neither one really did anything so far. Biden hasn't done enough, but then he's tried and been blocked by the Republicans in Congress again. And here we know that this weekend, uh, Mike Johnson is going down to Mar-a-Lago, I guess, to you know, rub noses with Trump again and get all their story straight and get whatever Trump's plan is into effect. And in the same way that Michael Cohen told us about the things that Trump does, he's never write them down. He doesn't ever say them exactly directly, um, right? He, he hems and haws. He uses sort of a code language when he says it. And there's no evidence. There's no recording. There's no anything that we can go back and look at. And I think that's something that Biden's really missing out on. What about all of the meetings that Trump had with Putin while he was in office? About what about all the other, you know, authoritarian leaders that he still supports to this day? So we've got a lot of independents that are not going to like Trump at all because of that. Foreign policy may not be a social issue exactly, but it kind of is. It's just a, a global social issue as opposed to a, a national social issue. 
So I think that's an important fact. And I think that Biden isn't using that enough, or the, the Democrats aren't just pushing that. What about what he did with all of the authoritarians around the world? And he's going to do it again. Now, one of the biggest issues that I find is a, a stick for me, and it must be for other Democrats and independents alike, because it's going to have to do with um, you know, trade and all that, because it's so important. And businessmen don't really like what Trump did as far as trade issues go. So I think that's going to be a sticking point for him. And now we've got another candidate we haven't really talked about. He's actually only on the ballot in one state, but he said he's, his campaign says he's got signatures to go into five more states. He just have to fill out the paperwork to get on the ballot. I think he's going to be a dark horse that we need to watch. Because he speaks to some of those MAGA people, right? Without having all that bad history. And, and you know, he was anti-vax and he's been involved in some uh, conspiracy theories and he's the little bombastic kind of like Trump is. So I, and then he's got that name that comes behind him too. Even though all of the rest of the Kennedys have said, don't vote for this guy, don't do it, right? So I think he's he's someone to watch. I really do. Well, I think you're right, because he's pulling at least uh, 10 to 13 percent away from Biden. Right. And so, uh, you know, we're talking about Robert Kennedy Jr. And his sworn, sworn mission is not to win the president of the United States. His sworn goal is to make sure Biden doesn't win. Uh, he has no plan or he has not stated any plan on a 270 electoral, uh, you know, vote count to get him and propel him to president of the United States. So, you know, going forward, you could say basically he's an ally of Trump and his sole mission is to pull votes away from Biden. But most importantly, where is he getting his funding? And one of them is the American value super PAC that's squarely in, in Donald Trump's camp is funding a lot of uh, Kennedy Jr.'s um, funding requests and issues. Your thoughts? Um, I, you know, campaign money is such a, I don't know, a sketchy thing. There's all these rules and nobody follows them. So what do we do about that? This is where my biggest concern is. And that is the Republican legislatures like Arizona, um, Georgia, uh, where's one another? North Carolina. Uh, these uh, Republican legislatures that have already taken over their electoral uh, system and programs. So that means they get to decide who gets the electors from their state. Now, whether Biden wins or not, they could still give the electors well, I think they corrected that in the Congress by saying that you need a 67 percent vote of both houses uh, before you can have uh, any legislature of any state deter away from that vote which came from the people for those candidates. Uh, they fixed that in 2023. So well, let me, add, let me like add a point, though, you guys. It, it's not just the electors. Um, it's the suppression. It's the, the rules of voting in that state. Uh, it's the gerrymandering. Um, it's the you know controlling of the polls and the poll workers and all that. And you know the Republicans have consistently and ubiquitously tried to screw up the system. And uh, I'm sure there's more to come on that. When we get closer to November, when we get to election day, we're going to see how 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 they've messed it up. You know, right down to mail-in voting and number of postal boxes or mail-in boxes that are available. I mean, all of those things, there's, there's 50 things that they're, that they're doing and will do in order to twist the vote um, and, and make it hard for minorities to vote and so forth. So it's not just the electors. It's much right. more. It's everything. We, before we go to Joe, uh, President Biden, and what is working for him, what's not working for him, um, Jay, let me... Let me throw out uh, something that Donald Trump recently stepped in, and that is on the abortion issue. He recently came up with a, um, a canned message saying that <clears throat> the abortion issue should be settled by the states and the states alone. Yet, not sooner did he make that uh, commitment 
that Arizona adopted a 19, an 1864 uh, almost complete abortion ban um, stating that all abortions and there will be jail time for anyone who assists a, a woman to get an abortion other than the saving of her life, um, incest and rape be damned. Um, this, this law that's just recently passed by the state Supreme Court of, of Arizona is going to come back to haunt Trump. Your thoughts? I have a couple of thoughts. Um, one is, you know, it's, it, it wasn't Arizona with the uh, 1864 law by itself. Um, there were a number of states prior to uh, Roe v. Wade that made abortion uh, a crime, um, a felony in many states. So, you know, it's not like that's in its own category. There were a lot of states that did that. Well, right now, Secondly, Arizona, <clears throat> Arizona has a 15-week um, allowance. And the, the state Supreme Court said, no, no allowance, no six months, zero months. Uh, yeah. Probably the, the toughest abortion ban in the country right now. Well, that's really tragic for Arizona. But it's only one state. It's an aberration. It's not how most other states and, and women in most other states feel. So I think Trump and Trump found himself on the wrong end of that issue. Now, he's responsible. He, he packed the court with anti-abortion judges. Um, it's no surprise that they did what they did in the Dobbs case. Um, so I think he had a he had a reversal of political you know direction here. He decided that was a great um, you know handicap to his campaign. So he had to soften it, and so he tried to soften it. But it goes you know and okay I guess he's the flexibility. But people on both sides of the aisle, you know, uh, are shooting at him over that because A, you know, he softened the position they wanted or he's not he's not sincere in softening position. You get both sides of that, you know. Well, yeah. So he, he doesn't I mean, win. Uh, you know, Lindsey Graham and Mike Pence came out yesterday to say, hey, you just left your, your loyal supporters on this issue out in the dust. Um, that's not good for Trump to have Lindsey Graham uh, his loyal lackey come out against him in the media. Yeah, from a political point of view, he should have left it alone. He just, he, you know, he he raised that flag and got shot down from both sides, um, or all three sides, if you want to treat Arizona as a side. Well, it's <laughs> a swing want, state, though. Yeah, what I wanted to mention though is there's something something else at play here for all of these issues, and see if you agree with me. This is it's a measure of a, whether people go to the polls, because when you have this kind of chaos in the election you know, and, and they say, I don't want to vote for Trump, but then I don't want to vote for Biden. And certainly that Kennedy guy, I'm not going to vote for him. I'm not going to vote. Let somebody else decide. This is really not in my wheelhouse. And I think, you know, some people will have that. There's no, there's no clear choice for a lot of people. And instead of making a decision that they may not feel entirely comfortable with, they make no decision. I think that's going to happen in various communities, various voters. But the other thing, and this is actually more pervasive, is that we have one side, Trump, lying against what Biden did. Um, the immigration issue, Cynthia, is really, really important um, because Trump scuttled that um, and then blamed Biden. The same way he scuttled, he scuttled the, the economy. He did a terrible time, terrible job during you know, his administration. And then he blames, he blames Biden for that. And the question is, and you guys must have your own thoughts about it, is do people understand that? Do, do the Democratic voters understand that? Do the Republican voters understand um, that Trump is lying to them, that his media is lying to them? In fact, the immigration mess is Trump's own fault with the Fischlugina wall and all that. Um, and all these remarkable statements about uh, how how Mexicans are bad people and cr criminals and whatnot. You know? Well, subhuman, I think was Sub, the term. Subhuman, thank you, thank you. Um, but what, what I'm saying is, uh, um, is that at the end of the day, they're not sure who's on what side of it. They're not sure who's responsible for the mess. They're not sure who can do a better job at fixing the mess whoever is responsible. So I think there's a huge amount of misinformation 
disinformation, and a, a failure to do critical thinking, mostly on, on the part of the base. You know, they don't understand what we're talking about here today, and they don't get media uh, to explain it to them. And they live in a world of propaganda that blames everything on Biden, and that's not true. Uh, so really, it's a question of where they went to school. Uh, you know, we talked before about the homeschool movement in this country, how, you know, the Republicans want to, um, you know, terminate public schools and public education. And so people get, you know, trained at home, educated at home, and they don't know anything. They are not equipped to be citizens and voters. Um, so what we have is a tremendous amount of ignorance. A lot of it is intentional ignorance, uh, where they simply do not understand what the score is. And, and, they, and they will believe Trump, as you said a minute ago. They will believe Trump no matter what he said. This is really sad. But this is the state of the country, and this is the state of our future, and this is the state of our leadership position in the world. As Jean-Paul Sartre said, les jeux sont faits, meaning the die is already cast, and we may not be able to get by this. We may have an ignorant electorate, and there's not too much we can do about it. Okay. Thank you, Jay. I'm more depressed than I was when I started the show. Uh, Cynthia, um, you know, the polling is showing that basically the two candidates are neck and neck. A couple percentage points one way or another, depending on what poll you read. Uh, they're neck and neck. Uh, it seems to me that Joe Biden and the Democrats have a, as a central theme, and an important one, is um, a vote for Biden is the preservation of the rule of law and the Constitution in a, a system of 240 plus years. Is that working for the Biden campaign? I don't think so. I, I think it needs way more than that. So you brought up polls. I don't really like polls because they're so subjective. You know, you never know if it's going to be uh, when they ask, who they ask, where they ask, all those things are so important. But something that struck me out of a, a recent NPR uh, PBS poll, and 40% of the people polled were uncertain mm -hmm. they were for. And I thought that was really striking. And it goes to Jay's point about this, you know, people are tired of all this. They don't want any part of it anymore. What's the point? We're right back where we started in 2020. Well, okay, let, let me go to that exact point. I mean, people now know that it's on the radar that a, a vote for Trump is the loss of a lot of freedoms that we may now experience, uh, a whole way of governance, uh, more of a democratic, re the, the, the republic, if you will, to a form of a autocracy. Uh, people know, I think they know the issues about that specific point. Are you saying that they're going to tune out, that that's no longer important to them? I, I don't know as I'd say they think it's not important. I think that they think that it's there's no point in it. It, it matters to them, but it seems like it doesn't matter what they do about it, nothing changes. So that's where the, the disconnect happens, right? It's not in that they don't care anymore. It's that, that they don't think it's going to make a difference. Okay. What, what is what is Biden's strongest point for his campaign right now as you see it? Strongest point? Yeah, that 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 that, that uh, attract voters to his camp. Three main points I think he needs to be making: the lies and the destruction that Trump did while he was in office, right, and the things where he was set up by Trump in it, the lies, the disinformation. Um, that's the stuff. The propaganda is the, if he doesn't attack the propaganda and every single one, you know, excuse me, we used to think just ignore it and it'll go away. That is a bad strategy these days. If there's a lie, call it a lie and, and, you know, replace it with the facts that are involved there. Should, oh, should, should Biden, should Biden, uh, harp on the January 6th or leave it alone? Uh, Yes, harp on it every day. Um, okay. The other one is that he needs to start being more attentive and intuitive with young people. Young people are a big chunk of why he got elected. And just giving them back their college, you know, loan money isn't going to do it. Just saying um, 
in the same sentence that he's against what Netanyahu is doing and he needs to back off, he also says that we're ironclad. Our support for Israel is ironclad. And he's lost every young person because of it. And uh, most every, I shouldn't say every, but- Well, you're, you're actually correct because, again, polling shows that for the first time that the young vote, the, uh, the youth vote is going towards Trump and the senior vote is going towards the Democrats. That's, that's completely reversed. Yeah. It is reversed. And I think he needs to expand on social media. Right. I, I mean, I think that MSNBC and CNN need to start going out on social media because I can tell you right now, Fox News is all over social media. But you don't hardly see anything from MSNBC or uh, even the big, you know, CBS, ABC, all of these mainstream media are not getting on board and, and, and Fox is filling the void. You know, NBC, NBC just announced a new uh, strategy for reporting the news. And I forget the title of it, but it's like NBC News confirmed that uh, this show is going to be dedicated to the facts and not a lot of commentary. It's kind of like my old uh, position is keep the news desk separate from the, the opinion desk, uh, the editorial desk. Uh, yes. So uh, allegedly, NBC is going to announce that or going to come out with that programming uh, within a month or so. <laughs> that makes my day because I've been thinking about this for quite a while now. Kid, we got to get that young vote back to the Democrats. We've got to get the truth to the young people because they don't know anything but what they're being told. If they're on Twitter, it is just miles and miles and miles, reams of people saying how bad Biden is, what a liar he is, what a pedophile he is. And when I was in the South last, and it wasn't that long ago, Biden was already president. And the South, they, that's what they think. They think that Biden is the pedophile. And they absolutely dismiss the fact that Trump had a 13-year-old girl accuse him of rape at right. the, um, I got a mental block against his name, the guy that died with the Epstein. island. Epstein. Epstein. Thank you very much. I think I block out his name on purpose. I'm not sure. But at any rate, it was out in the Florida. It wasn't on the island. It was in the Florida mansion. And, and it's so believable. And the details are, so, if you look into the case, they're so specific. And then she dropped it twice. She dropped it once because she was threatened. She got a little bit older and she decided she was going to stand up against him one more time and was threatened. Her family was threatened. And so she dropped it again. This okay. is stuff we're dealing with anything when people come out against trump he threatens their family look at the the judges and the prosecutors and the witnesses that he's gone after it's terrifying to think what's going to happen in these trials coming up you know we go back and forth about whether the trials are going to help him or hurt him if we could get some truth out there into the social media verse whatever you want to call it then then maybe these trials wouldn't have a positive effect. But right now, it's just, oh, the Bidens are beaten up on me. Oh, the Biden, you know, or the Trump. I mean, or uh, the he, He's won the narrative on that. I agree. He's won the narrative. All right. Well, guess what? We've run out of time. In fact, we've gone over our time. So, Cynthia, why don't you wrap up with your final thoughts about where the two campaigns are, whether or not, uh, you know, RFK Jr. is, you know, he only is... Um, on the ballot, I believe, in Utah, whether he's a force to be reckoned with. Go ahead and let loose and let it fly. He, well, his campaign does say that he, they have five other um, states that they have enough signatures for. So, yeah, he's only on one in Utah, you're right. Okay, well, I still think he's a dark horse because I think so many people are sick of him. I think he's going to win not just independents, but some Democrats, I think he's going to win the youth vote with that young lawyer lady, Shanahan. And I think that he's going to win a lot of Republicans, too, because he kind of gives them that same, um, you can be ignorant, you can be bombastic, that, you know, they, they want to have that those tendencies in them, uh, you know, go up to a place of 
authority, so maybe they're not so bad either kind of thing. So a lot of those people are going to come over. Ignorant by choice is a problem because that's what a lot of the MAGA voters are, is ignorant by choice. They know better, but they choose not to know better. Um, okay. They'll they'll sort of uh, sacrifice their integrity to get what they want, the abortion, the lower regulations, whatever those things are. So, okay, of course, you know, I have a quote. Okay. <laughs> Since I'm talking about Kennedy so much, I chose a John F. Kennedy quote, his uncle's quote. Um, Too often we enjoy the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Nice. Nice way to end it. Thank you very much, Cynthia. Uh, Jay, let it fly. Your your thought, final thoughts on uh, the three campaigns. Well, I'm happy to hear that uh, a month from now, a month from now will be, mm, what, May, June, um, that um, some of these networks will, will distinguish fact from opinion. Um, but fact alone doesn't do it because... Um, you know, the, the facts are in contention. You have the other side, the Republican side, saying, well, those facts are untrue. They're untrue. <clears throat> so these media are reporting untrue. And so there has to be some advocacy on the part of, mm, you know, the, the media that wishes to report the facts, saying, no, these are the facts. And what they're saying, that's untrue. So it's not, you can't just make a cold statement of fact without defending the fact as more true than what the other guys are saying. Um, that's one thing. You asked uh, Tim about, <clears throat> you know, what one of the strongest points that, say, for example, Biden has. Well, you know, I don't think his strongest point is Israel. He's been wishy-washy. And I don't think his strongest point is Ukraine. He's been wishy-washy. And, you know, the, uh, there doesn't a day go by without hearing about some tragedy in Ukraine that could have been avoided had Ukraine been supported. And his leadership, the small L um, of the EU and NATO, is, is really not making a difference because they're getting soft also. I like to think that in some places in Europe, you know, we have a, a, a reemergence of the of democracy and the rule of law, but I think that's small and it's in its own category, sort of like Arizona on the abortion issue. Um, you know, for example, Hungary is a vote against Orban. And uh, in um, Turkey, there's a vote against, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Recep Tayyip uh, Erdogan. Um, but, the, you know, the, I think what's happened here is that Biden has gotten wishy-washy, has been unable to achieve his goals in Europe and in the global liberal world order. This is not going to help him. The biggest thing that could help him, okay, is what I was suggesting, that the Liberal press has to call Trump out every time. We all agree. And it has to do that in a way that will reach the largest number of people. Um, and it can't be just a statement of fact. It has to be a, a statement of advocacy. And finally, you know, I think the biggest swing thing here is these trials. And, you know, if you ask me whether the trials are going well, I'm not sure I can say that. Um, but I can say that Trump is being revealed as a criminal. Whether he gets convicted or not, he's being revealed as a person who intimidates. He's being revealed as a person who would, who would pull the rug out from under our democracy and form of government. Um, I wish the trials were going better. Maybe they will. Maybe they will with Alvin Bragg next week. But um, you know, for the moment, it's, it's hard to rally around that point. It should be a huge point. How can you elect a boor like this who is a criminal, who is an intimidator. Um, the, but the last point I want to make, just give me one more second, and that is this. Um, people do not realize what the loss of democracy means. It's pretty clear that Trump will diminish our democracy and our constitution. He said so in so many words. He's testing as, a, as any good psychopath would. Um, but the reality is if he's elected, he, he will diminish our democracy. And people don't understand. I'm not sure what kind of mindset they have. They don't understand what that means. They have no idea what happened in Europe in the 30s and many times elsewhere, how people lost their civil rights, lost their, you know, their quality of life, their quality of, 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 of living unimpeded by government. 
And so I, I think um, they should know, somebody should tell them what it means. Somebody should tell them, um, you know, that, that with, with, a, with a leader like this, um, they will not be free to do what they want. And they will be worried about being turned in, about how their, how their kids will turn them in and their friends will turn them in and their relatives will turn them in and they will be prosecuted. They will be harassed by the Internal Revenue Service. They will, a number of them, be the victims of that, um, that, uh, that process where Trump punishes his enemies. Um, and I don't think people realize that. And, I, and I'm hoping, you know, this goes back to your point, Tim, very important point. It's all in the media. The media has got to get its act together. They're still operating on an old sort of a classical media basis. It's not just facts and opinion. It's they have, they have got to be, mm, they've got to be the media that saves us. <laughs> and I don't think they're saving us. And it, as it's getting more obvious as we go forward. And at the end of the day, they, they will, if Trump wins, they will disappear. He will make them go away. You didn't mention the, the Times and the Post and the surviving newspapers right now. I mean, we will not have information and we will be less able to, to participate in a democratic society if he wins. And therefore, we will be victims of oppression and a lack of civil rights and uh, re retribution. So people don't know that. They have to know that before they go into the ballot box. All righty. Well, I'd like to thank my co-host, Jay Fidel, my special esteemed guest, Cynthia Lee Sinclair for their profound comments. Certainly no uh, further comment from me is necessary because they've said it quite well today. And I'd like to thank them for their appearance. I'm Tim Mappicella for American Issues Take One. Why don't you join us next week? And until then, aloha. this show, why don't you give us a like or subscribe to our channel. Thanks so much.